Wait for a minute there. Um, so I'll just start with some just some preliminaries for the for the interview. So today we'll be discussing um, direct provision asylum centres in Ireland. I will be interviewing Ronit Lentin, who has written an article about the current issue. Um, your article is called Spaces of Racialization: Ireland's Direct Provision Asylum Centres as Sites of Deport Deportability. So the first question is, if you could just give us a, like a brief overview about the article, um, exactly what direct provisions are and like some of the issues that asylum seekers are facing in Ireland at the moment. Okay, um, direct provision was introduced into Ireland in 1999 after Britain started dispersing asylum seekers throughout the country. The idea was that uh, asylum seekers will be accommodated in these centers most of which were quite remote in areas which were not accessible to the general population. And Ireland had, in fact, a very quite a bad record in accepting refugees started in World War II, when only 60 Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany were accepted by neutral Ireland between 1933 and 1946. After that, <clears throat> there were various program refugees who were invited to Ireland, but by and large, Ireland did not have a very good record, and it also endorsed international contact late. In the 90s, Ireland became more affluent, and asylum seekers started coming to Ireland. And there, from the beginning, refugees or asylum seekers became a problem. And dispersing them in these centers seem to be the solution. They call direct provision because people there head and board and some um, um, a comfort allowance like pocket money, <clears throat> but no welfare um, allowances. And basically the problem was that they were in fact coercively um, uh, confined in these places. And that continued the tradition in Ireland of coercively confining unmarried mothers and their poor children in centers outside of the cities and in really remote locations. Um, over the years, Ireland had received more than 100,000 asylum applications, not very much, and there is, its rate of accepting or making people refugees was quite low. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of the system for many Yes, people didn't quite know about the plight of asylum seekers because they're hidden from public view, as were these unmarried mothers and their children who were incarcerated in church and church run institutions. This has changed in 2014 when asylum seekers got organized and in fact brought the case to the public domain, to the public view. And this is the system which continues to this, this, um, this time. In fact, at the moment, I just checked there are 11,600 people in the rec provision centers. Wow. Many of them, uh, many of the centers are run by private um, owners who do it for profit. And they charge the government quite a lot of money to accommodate um, people in, 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 who apply for international protection. Um, so my second question is, you kind of mentioned it in the first, it's like some of the asylum seekers you interviewed, um, what have you said about the conditions in the um, in the direct provisions? Like after I read your article, I searched the, some images up on Google and they just they just look quite horrible. So I know you there's some passages in the article, but if you could just go through like some of the conditions exactly like inside the direct provisions. Basically, we've interviewed, over the years, we interviewed many people. It's in a book that I've done with um, um, Vukashin Delkovic, who himself was an asylum seeker, who documented the system. Uh, the book was published in 2021. And many of the people told us primarily about overcrowding because the centers are owned by providers. The more people they seek in a room, the more money they make per room. So very often people are accommodated together in, um, um, you know, people are just put in, in rooms together. They don't necessarily speak the same language. They don't share the same religion or culture. And it becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. They also complain about um, um, the fact that very often families have to share a single room, parents and children, which makes it extremely difficult to have any sort of life. 
particularly as Alma Sigrid was speaking about the difficulties for parents to have, for instance, sex life when children have to be there at the same time. But also it means that it's hard for the, the families to maintain any sort of behavioral authority over the children. Food is usually inadequate, very often um, past its sell by date, not very good food. And very often people have to eat, or always people have to eat at, at, at the time, at the specific time. It's like in a hospital, a hospital regime or prison regime. And very often there's nothing to eat in the kitchen outside these hours, which leaves lots of children, lots of children particularly, but also adults hungry. People are um, um, complaining about the bad maintenance and services within the area. There's not enough areas for children to play. There's not enough areas for people to congregate. And they have to sign on on a daily basis. And if they're absent for more than 72 hours, they may lose their place. Um, they are monitored by CCTV cameras. And very often, just there's no freedom, no respect. People have complained about having, for instance, to have showers in a communal shower. Mm -hmm. There's not enough washing facilities, washing machines. So in short, most of the places are very, very badly um, suited to accommodate uh, people. Many of the places were in holidays, in old um, bed and breakfast, and all, also in, in um, um, you know, former, um, former uh, convents and so suitable for people to be to to reside and in recent years more and more people are living in hotels and obviously for the hotel owners particularly during kind of the rundown of the corona and all, all the rest of it this is huge huge profit yeah. so basically what we have spoken about is about the asylum industrial complex in ireland because these places make money for few owners and it's not only the owners who make the money, it's all the service provision. People who provide electricity and heating and food and other services. So the whole area basically benefits from the incarceration or the confinement of people all whose crime was seeking protection from, from oppression and from persecution. And I think this is basically what people are telling, telling us. Yeah. You said some of them have complained does anything ever happen after they complain or is it just pretty much ignored? Very often when they complain, they get penalized, uh, yeah. they get moved to another another center. Very often after they've made friends with the people in the center, they're arbitrarily moved and they can very often be arbitrarily moved without any reason, which makes it very difficult. The story, one of the, the people I, I, I cite in the article is somebody who just thrown out of a place and he had to come to another city knew nobody and he had to wait outside until he was let in the system is pretty arbitrary they yeah. don't have a choice of where they want to when to live where, where they want where, where they want to live and very often people have been moved <clears throat> and for children it's difficult because children make some friends local and moved away and this is this is this has been really difficult the arbitrary nature of a um, we have to say that people are not are not forced to reside in direct provision. When they come to seek asylum, they're offered a place. But because if they don't reside in asylum in, in direct provision, they receive allowances, they receive no um, food or board, and they have to look after themselves, and, and they, they receive no medical card, which entitles them to free medical treatment. So people people accept it because there's no other, very often no other option. You call these um, sites of deport deportability. What exactly is this? And how are these direct provisions sites of deportability? Uh, the term was, was coined by Nick de Genova, Nicolas de Genova. And basically a site of deportability is a place where the immigration authorities can come and pick up people for the deportation. And they are based waiting for deportation, particularly when their um, asylum application has been refused very often on appeal. We must remember that some of these people have lived in direct provision for more than seven years without hearing about their decision, which is hugely difficult. Now, deportability is not like deportation, because very often de deportation cannot be carried out for 
of reasons, because the country accepting them would not take them, or because um, um, of human rights considerations. So it's under the sitting deported. So that's why uh, I think Nicolas Jodanova's term, site of deportability, is, is actually very, very um, um, relevant here. Um, you call these direct provisions racialized zones of non-being. Can you like, go a bit in depth to what that means and how exactly these asylum seekers aren't fully recognized as human beings? Well, you know, we 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 talk about kind of the whole um, the whole system being a racialized system. The thing is, of course, not all asylum seekers are black or brown or Muslim or whatever, but they are classified as people apart who can be just because they sought asylum, which is everybody's got the full legal right to seek asylum, they racializes others, people about whom the government can make decisions. You can make decisions to incarcerate them, to confine them, to move them, to deport them, but also to suddenly lift this. You know, so people are racialized as less than the people who are um, fully citizens. And this this division between fully human um, um, citizens and not quite human or non-human people who are classified as asylum seekers basically takes away their humanity. But there's lots of other ways as well. People have complained, for instance, we have Bulelani on FACO, who is a, a gay man from South Africa, who is still in the system after something like six years. He's brilliant. He's the He's the um, spokesperson of the movement for asylum seekers in Ireland. But he, because he's gay, he has been, um, had to listen to homophobic remarks in the center, just as he had to do in South Africa, which is why he sought asylum. So he feels that he, human rights, and he said human rights are indivisible, indivisible <coughs> basically, are not fully respected. He also says this, the, the right of children to, to the, the right of the child. And in fact, children's rights are not respected in, in the asylum system. Uh, women's rights are not respected because women are very often given to abuse, not only from people within the centers and from management, but also very often from men who prowl around the centers and try to get the women to do business. They treat them as potential prostitutes. So there's no protection for people in the asylum, in these asylum centers, protection which should be available to women because she is human. So, considering all these violations, human rights violations, where where would you say we go from here in terms of like reforming the system, or if it's even possible? Okay, reform is problematic. The demand by Massey, the movement for asylum seekers, uh, asylum seekers in Ireland, is abolished. Prior to the um, establishment of the asylum, uh, the, the direct provision centers, people were living um, on rent. And in fact, it cost less for the government to pay the rent allowances and allow them to find jobs. Asylum seekers were not allowed to work for a, for a wage until uh, 2018. So talking about reforming. The government has made promises when it came into office a couple of years ago that in its lifetime, the lifetime of this government, the system will be ended. In fact, nothing has changed. In fact, things have become much, much worse um, because Ireland is suffering from a huge homeless crisis or ho housing crisis, and things have become much worse. So one of the things we're looking at is the huge resistance asylum seekers themselves have displayed through the establishment of Massey, through demonstration, through bringing their case to the public domain. So much so that in the last few weeks, the media, the mainstream media have started talking about it very openly, particularly since the arrival of some 50,000 refugees for whom the government has no space because there's not enough housing. In fact, in the last few days, and it's been freezing here, I know it's been freezing <laughs> in England as well, people have tents, they're not kind of small tents, they're large tents, is slightly more robust, but there's no, these tents don't include toilets, so people have to go out to the toilet. There's mm -hmm. Families have to share a big tent together. So basically, what we're seeing is the mainstream media have understood, perhaps because the Ukrainians are making quite a lot 
Europeans know, knows about it. Ukraine is seen as people like us, Europeans, white, and so on and so forth. But in fact, the plight of people seeking international asylum is much worse than that of the Ukrainians, because the Ukrainians have been promised that wherever possible, accommodation will be found for them. And the other thing that's happening, the government is not coping with organizing the, the rights um, documentation for asylum seekers. So when Ukrainians come, and of course they should be accommodated and there's no doubt about it, but when they come, the papers are being processed. The children can go to school within a few days, but some asylum seekers and their children are stuck in hotels or in direct provision centers for months on end, the children not being able to go to school because the paperwork has not been processed. So this is a real racialization of one group of people and non-racialization of other groups of people. And, and um, what, what these children are saying in these hotels, can't go to school, the families go crazy, and, and mass noises about it. So I think, I think what we need is, first of all, equality and equal treatment. And Ireland has to fulfill its obligations according to all uh, law and conventions and treat everybody with respect. The system should be ended, not reformed, because no reform it would be adequate. And we have to abolish this asylum uh, industrial complex system whereby some people are making a lot of money of the Irish government and the taxpayer to accommodate people inadequately and really not to look after them properly. Whereas their crime, so-called crime, is to seek asylum from persecution and oppression. So I think when we're not talking about reform, we're talking about the government fulfilling its promise to end the system, to close it down and to find another way to accommodate people. People who deal with housing are talking about compulsory purchase orders by local authority, because in Ireland at the moment, there are 180,000 empty properties. Some of them holiday properties, some of them just not being used. And we need to take them over and to build social housing and to provide both for people seeking asylum and for refugees, but also for Ireland's other Um, so you mentioned that the severe housing crisis that's going on in Ireland at the moment. Um, you've also mentioned that there's, there's been a slight difference in dealing with applicants for asylum and Ukrainian refugees in Ireland. Um, is there any other sort of differences you see in the way they deal with um, applicants for asylum and Ukrainian refugees? Like you've mentioned that Ukrainian refugees, they can go to school within a couple of days, but um, applicants for asylum, they're it's not as soon as they have to wait. Is there any other sort of differences you see as well? Well, I, th I think there's a clear discrimination there. And, and asylum seekers themselves have said, we are delighted to see the government is dealing well with Ukrainian refugees. That is how it should be, but they're talking about equality of treatment. And in fact, some Ukrainian refugees are not very pleased with the fact that they're not waltzing into housing immediately as they arrive because they're Europeans and they see, they see it as the right, which of course it is, but people who seek international have the same right to be treated with dignity and equality. And that's what we're saying. So I think, I think, it's, I think the fact that the Ukrainian refugees have raised their voices and have gone to the media means that the me mainstream media are at long last starting to cover this issue and people are talking about the plight of asylum seekers is also that at the moment Ireland is, doesn't have a far-right party but at the moment we're seeing far-right noises and demonstrations against asylum, asylum and refugees in various places in the country and this is very worrying because we don't want this um, um, upsurge in the number of people seeking refugee, um, refugee uh, refuge in Ireland bringing about a, a rise of far-right racism the government is trying to do what it can, but it's not doing, I mean, it's talking about finding solutions. And just I just found an article today that in October, the government was saying that some asylum seekers who have full-time work will have to pay rent for the place in direct provision, which is absolutely preposterous, because it is not the place they, they would have chosen to live in. 
it's not a very convenient place and it's not a very um, um, pleasant place to live in. Many people have to, as I say, share rooms. And even if they have their own individual rooms, it doesn't include the bathroom. And lots of people are finding it extremely hard to cope. And some of them are friends. They're people we know, the people we work with, they're people like us. As been said before, there's no, uh, the, it's a one world. It's not these people come, coming into our world. This is our world together and we all have to be the same. And I think I'm maybe a bit of an idealist, <laughs> but I think that's what I believe in and that's what yeah. I've worked for in all my, in all my working life. Thank you. Um, lastly, is there anything else you're working on at the moment? Anything similar or is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Well, I'm, I'm kind of end, get, getting towards the end of my career <laughs> and I've retired yeah. from university work um, a few years ago. But at the moment I'm finalizing a book on race in Palestine with the Palestinian co-editor. I've done lots of work on Palestine mm -hmm. as well from the point of view of looking at it from race, race perspective. And I'm working with Lana Tatur, who is a Palestinian academic, and we are finalizing an edited collection of race and really much looking forward to sending it to the publisher very soon. It's been a long process due to Corona and all the rest yeah. of it, but it's doing well. And this is the other stuff that I'm working on at the moment. But frankly, maybe I don't really intend to do that much yeah. academic work in the future and yeah. enjoy my grandchild. <laughs> well, I look forward to reading your new work when it does come out. Um, thank you. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm sure people who watch here will also get a good overview about your article and the current issues that are going on in Ireland because before I even read your article, I wasn't, I certainly didn't know half the stuff that even goes on there. So yes, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, yeah. Shumi. Thank you. Um,